Good evening, and welcome to Colorado Decides, a joint production of Colorado Public Television, CBS4, KOA News Radio, and KUNC Public Radio. I'm your host, Dominic Gazzuti. Thank you very much for joining us. Joining me is Sean Boyd, political specialist with CBS4 News. And tonight, we continue our coverage of the 2018 primary election with the Republicans running to become the next governor of Colorado. Joining us for the next 60 minutes are former Mayor of Parker, Greg Lopez, businessman Victor Mitchell, and businessman Doug Robinson. Missing from our lineup today is State Treasurer Walker Stapleton. I feel I need to explain why Treasurer Stapleton is not here. We made our very best effort to work within Treasurer Stapleton's very busy schedule. We offered three different dates that would allow us to present a debate to you, the voters, within the first week of the mail-in ballots being sent out. We made that request the week after the state assemblies in April. The Stapleton campaign declined those dates, but offered two dates that would have pushed our broadcast to a full 10 days after the ballots were sent out. After initially declining their offer of those two dates, eight days later, I proposed two additional dates in May. And after hearing no response, we decided that we would try to accommodate his schedule and asked if the original dates they offered were still available. We were told those dates were no longer available. That brings us to our debate today. We're, di we're disappointed that Pre Treasurer Stapleton could not join us, but as you can see, we did our best. In full disclosure, I want to offer that the other seven candidates running for governor, both Democratic and Republican, all confirmed the single date we offered them within 48 hours of contact. Okay, let's get to our debate with the other three candidates looking to become the next governor of Colorado. Sean, would you like to start us off? Thank you. So, as you know, we had the Democratic candidates here last week, and I started out with a question for them of what policy of Bernie Sanders that they don't support. So I want to ask you a similar question to name one policy where you disagree with President Trump. And I want a policy, not a personality trait. Doug, we'll start with you. Yeah, so uh, I don't think that his policies that he's put forward on tariffs and trade are good for Colorado. Uh, they're not good for our beer industry. They're not good for our farmers. So I disagree with him on that. But many of the things and policies he's put forward, I think, have been very good for Colorado. I look at the tax cut. That's been good for, for Colorado families, putting more money into their pocketbooks. I look at the uh, changes that he's made in terms of the uh, judges, more conservative judges into our courts. That's another thing that's very positive for Colorado. So uh, many of the things that he's done, most of the, th the policy uh, decisions that he's made, I do agree with. But this one on trade and tariffs, I think is the wrong way for Colorado. Okay, thank you for that answer. Victor? You know, the biggest policy problems he's had is by putting a team together, and he's had a lot of turnover, as we all know, various different positions. But by and large, I've also very supportive of most of his policies. I think he, what he's done with tax reform, I think, is going to be tremendously uh, beneficial for Colorado. Now, his style to take on co countries like China and Canada, for example, one of our close, actually our closest ally. Uh, and talk about putting tariffs on aluminum, I would probably disagree with as well. But we have to start thinking about uh, so many of our jobs, our manufacturing jobs have been decimated. Uh, we basically don't have a manufacturing base here in Colorado, uh, largely because of the Gallagher Amendment and, uh, and other regulations. So for Trump to really go out and fight for the working man, to try to bring back more manufacturing and many other policies, I generally support of them, most especially the tax reform bill, which I think is going to just be enormously important for Colorado small businesses. Okay, thank you, Greg. You know, uh, with the president, you know, the policies that he's putting forward are really helping the country. You know, and I can't really think of one that I would say I don't agree with. Perhaps there's one where I could say he might have taken a different approach. That would be the NAFTA, you know, and how we're dealing with NAFTA with Canada and, and Mexico because they're so close to our borders. I mean, that's really something that they're our neighbors and we really need to see how we can work more closely with them. But as far as all the other policies, you know, I think he's doing a great job for the country. And you can see it in the unemployment rates with the Hispanic vote, uh, I mean, with the Hispanics and the black individuals. And so I think he's doing a great job. If I could add one other thing, too, that I think is important. I think that the way the uh, Unaffordable Care Act was trying to be repealed was probably a mistake as well. We should have just gone for a straight-out repeal, and then it would have forced both with a, phase, a reasonable phase-out period. That then would have forced both the Democrats and the Republicans to work together if they wanted to come forward with a comprehensive uh, health care bill. Uh, but right now, I mean, I look at, I think the greatest challenge facing our great state is, is that 40 percent of Coloradans today have health care and, and have health insurance but can't meet their uh, deductible 
collectibles. And I think that's really, it's, it's never talked about, it's not talked about nearly enough. I, hear, I talk to families on a regular basis where this is really a driving force in their lives, but I think we should have taken a different approach as Republicans, uh, and President Trump maybe uh, could have done better on just focusing on a straight out repeal with a reasonable phase out period. And then it ultimately, I believe, would have forced both sides to have worked better together. Well, Victor, let's just call that a segue into uh, healthcare, which is a major issue. Let me start off, uh, Sean has some great questions, comes with some specifics. Let me start broader on the national side of things. Obamacare seems uh, pretty unpopular among conservative base. I can understand uh, folks in your position saying that we should get rid of Obamacare, or this should have been on the national level. But all of you are running for governor. What is the governor of Colorado going to do about health care? Because all the Obamacare points that I'm hearing are national issues. If you want to change that, you're running for the wrong job. Uh, Greg, let's start with you. You know what? It's, it's interesting when we talk about the health care. And I think it's, it really there's not that much difference between the national side and the state side. You know, the bottom line is health care is really unaffordable, no matter where you go. Okay, so we really need to bring competitive markets back into the healthcare industry. One of the questions that I'm going to have as governor is why does it cost so much for someone to be able to get treatment from a medical facility? You know, we never ask that question. We always ask about how we can we pay for, for these types of services. I think it's time we ask the hard questions. Why is it costing so much for us to be able to have good health care? And I think until we have that debate and we have that dialogue, we're always going to be kind of chasing our tail because we're not having the right discussion. And for most people, the fact that we talk about them being able to afford it, when you talk to people in Colorado, and specifically out in the rural corridors, there is no affordable health care. You know, it's all a sham. It's all a, a smoke and mirrors. We really need to get down to the, to the brass tacks of it. Well, Greg, let me push back because in a free market, which I imagine as conservatives you're all big favors of, uh, a health care company can say the reason health care costs so much is because it can and deal with it. So if that's the answer, now what do you do? Well, you know what? If that's the answer, we encourage more co competition. You know, it's more competition because at the end of the day, it's a consumer. Sure. The consumer is going to decide where they're going to go get their services. I want to step in here and ask, yeah. healthcare is a different type of free market. It's the one free yes. market where we can't compare prices. Absolutely. And there have been quite a few bills down at the state Can legislature yeah. right, that have addressed this. But it's been Republicans, by and large, that have killed those transparency bills when it comes to hospitals and drug pricing. So I want to know, as governor, what you would do with regard to legislation like that. Well, Victor, you want to jump in here? Yeah, I mean, this has been this is great. This has been my the biggest issue I've talked about since the campaign started. I mean, this is actually my wife and I are practicing Catholics. We support a rural health clinic in Southern Virginia that happens to be probably one of the most efficient uh, primary care providers in the country. Uh, they're changing the whole way primary care is delivered. And actually, one of the reasons that really inspired me to ultimately run for governor, uh, we, we now have 26% of Coloradans are on Medicaid, if you can believe that. So we have a 3% unemployment rate. Well, more than one in four people are on Medicaid. Medicaid, government insurance, uh, was never designed for the masses. And it's really low-quality, ration, extremely expensive care. Uh, there's innovative health clinics that we're seeing all over the country, especially in southern Virginia, where they, get, they deliver 25,000 high-quality patient, uh, patient experiences last year for a million and a half dollars, charging ten dollars uh, per visit. They don't accept any insurance whatsoever. I want to get us entirely out of the Colorado Health Exchange entirely. I want to get us out of the Medicaid expansion, which is roughly six hundred and fifty million dollars, blowing up over, uh, blowing up our entire state budget. Work closely with the federal government to obtain thirteen thirty-two waivers, so we have total control over this money, and create an, uh, a committee of, of basically retired nurses and doctors, and really encourage innovation in healthcare, where maybe a nurse practitioner clinic would be put forward or a physician assistant clinic based clinic mental health professional clinic uh, they would review their plans it had it would have to have full transparency in pricing uh, they would be my, but my ultimate vision is where any Colorado rich or poor could be able to access high quality uh, primary care without insurance I mean it, it, primary care can be done very very affordably and quite predictably it's very different than specialty care or long-term illness uh, but we, we lack this kind of imagination. I've been a reformer my whole life as an entrepreneur. I've built six successful companies. This is what I've done my whole career, and I hope to do that for Colorado. Let's get Doug involved in the uh, health care questions and the transparency part that uh, yeah. Sean's talking about. Yeah, so, uh, so this is exactly where we need to go. Health care costs too much across this state. It is breaking family budgets. It's breaking businesses. It's breaking our, our local 
people in our state government, and I have lost faith in Washington's ability to solve it. They've had 30 years. Give it to the states, and the key is price transparency and more competition in this marketplace. How, what, what other industry do you know of where often you don't know what you just consumed until the bill comes weeks later? It doesn't make any sense. And people say, oh, it's too hard to do. It is not. We need leadership. We need to bring our providers together and say, okay, tell us what an MRI costs. Tell us what a broken leg costs. Just that in an, by itself will bring more competition into the cost of health care. We need to do the same thing in terms of uh, more competition in health insurance as well. We need to allow employers and churches and rural counties to pool together to get more people so that there's more people to, you know, more competition. The nine arbitrary divisions that we've made in terms of how we provide uh, insurance in the state, those ought to be relooked at. We should have a statewide exchange. Those things would make a difference in terms of bringing competition into the marketplace as Republicans. And I think, you know, let the marketplace determine, but we have to have price transparency and more competition. And statewide insurance pools would not work, Doug. I have no confidence in that whatsoever, because if you can't really assess the risk in small rural communities, then fewer and fewer insurance providers are going to participate. We need fewer mandates on insurance companies, a more simplified insurance process options, kind of what you alluded to as well, but also giving people the ability to bolt on certain specific types of services uh, they like. All of this is going to take a great deal of coordination with the federal government, and that's why I was so strongly supportive of a straight-out repeal of the Unaffordable Care Act, like I like to coin it. I mean, it's just not where there's been three big winners. It was pharmaceutical companies have done very well, hospitals, have done very well, but the insurance industry has basically more than doubled uh, their profits since it was passed. So, so we have to figure out better solutions for all Coloradans. And, and Representative Mitchell, I disagree. I think you have a statewide, uh, they're not going to like it, they don't want this, but they will show up. It's too big of a marketplace. It's 5.5 million people. You know, I mean, they wouldn't all be in that uh, group, but uh, it's a big state. There's lots of money to be made. You know, when They'll you talk about up. transparency, just to we'll give get, you a yeah, quick One idea. more comment, then we'll get to the next question. You know, Go ahead. Just to give you an idea. You know what? If you ask a doctor if you can pay cash for the service, he'll give you a 20, 25% discount. So when you hear that, there, you know there's something more behind the pricing than just the cost. So, um... Switching gears here, we noted off the top of the show, Dominic did, that um, Treasurer Stapleton is not here today. Um, I, I think a lot of people think of him as kind of the establishment candidate in this race. The Colorado Springs Gazette ran an editorial in January calling on all of you to essentially get out of the race and Republicans to unite behind Walker Stapleton. Do you feel like the GOP establishment has essentially anointed Stapleton? and? Does that give you guys a fair shake? And Victor, let's start with you on this one. I mean, I'm the only clear, true outsider businessman in this race. <laughs> I spent 31 years as an entrepreneur, two years as a legislator more than 10 years ago, and went back into the uh, uh, private sector. Obviously, uh, the, there are certain party establishment people <laughs> that love Walker Stableton because basically they can give him a tremendous amount of special interest money, and they feel he's more predictable. Uh, they can, can probably control him better. Uh, but by and large, I think it's been a very fair uh, race. I mean, sure, they've been they've done things like stack questions and in, in different forums and things like that. That's kind of just goes with the party establishment. But by and large, I trust the voters. I think the voters will get this right. I'm by far and away uh, the most qualified person to lead our state forward. I've put the forward the biggest ideas, the most substantive ideas. Uh, so I think it's just kind of a non-factor. Doug, what do you think? Where, where's Walker? I mean, this is the question that we all need to be asking, right? He's not here. I'm not surprised. He doesn't show up at half of our events. We have worked all of us, the state, and uh, every small town and so on. He's not there. He wasn't here on para reform. He says he's been the voice on para, yet this was the biggest thing that was happening to para in terms of its reform since 2010. He wasn't at the board meeting. He didn't. He told us where he was the night of the debate. He said he was in bed himself. He said he went to bed early that night. He was not lobbying the legislators. He hasn't shown up. And I need to take uh, issue with uh, Representative Mitchell here as well. He calls himself the only outsider in the race. He said this again and again. I'm the only one I've never run for office. Victor was a representative. He's the only one of us that has actually been elected to the state house. He was down there. He got frustrated. He said it himself. Uh, didn't get things done. Was frustrated after a couple of years down there. Uh, I am a, haven't run for 
for office before? I don't know how you say you know, that you're the only outsider with, with uh, believing that. You, obviously you do because you've sent it again and again. <laughs> Doug, are okay. you really serious? You're George Romney's grandson. You're Mitt Romney's well, here, it, nephew. Let me, let me I mean, you come yeah. from the blue, bluest blood political dynasty in our entire country. But he's not I held mean, office. I mean, he's but right. his right. entire so family's you know, business you know is politics. When, when, we were, when we were at Channel 9, we asked the guys the same question. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous. You know, if, if you look at the debate on Channel 9, even Victor agreed that I was not the establishment and that Doug wasn't the establishment. So why he keeps saying it, I don't know. But let me tell you, let's go back to the question. Okay, the mm -hmm. question that you asked. You know what? I find it always very interesting that, you know, there is a sentiment, and I will tell you there is a sentiment out there, that the establishment traditionally picks, it, picks someone that they feel truly can win the election, okay? And I feel it, but you know what? I don't pay attention to it. I don't pay attention to it because it's the voters. They don't speak for the voters. You know, it's the candidates that are out there every single day talking to people, shaking hands. We're in the living rooms. We're in the diners. We're in the, you know, in the meetings. And we're talking to them. You know, and I can tell you that there is this sentiment out there that, you know what, it's time for us to really get back to the grassroots, get back to where people are actually connecting. You know, and so for me, you know what, uh, I respect other people's opinions. That doesn't mean I have to agree with them. You know, if I would have expect if I would have respected the opinions when I was running for mayor at the age of 27, I never would have got elected. You know, so it's about connecting. Can well, I just well, respond well, to well, Representative Mitchell? I mean, he he's says this again and again about my family. We're going to go ahead and uh, we're going to continue down the same path. So you're going to have a chance to kind of uh, answer that well with this question. With the representative, you well, know, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a business owner for 31 years. I spent two years in the legislature a decade ago, and I went back to the private sector. It's a bit rich. It's misleading to the good viewers that are listening to this program. But Doug does make a point. He has not held public office. So, so um, he, I think th this conversation right here is exemplifying my question. Is that, uh, the Republican Party right now is, I'm not sure if it's evenly split, but there is a significant split between establishment Republicans and populist Republicans. And it's this race to saying, I'm not establishment or I am establishment, and that being uh, carrying some sort of credence with some part of the party and trying to figure out which part of the party is going to step up and make it worth your while that you don't have any experience or you do have some experience or some experience in the middle that has anything to do with what you're going to do as the, the, the person who's running the entire state of Colorado. Yes. So it's, please speak to that division in the Republican Party and how you address it because as the governor, if elected, you would be legitimately the leader of the Colorado Republican Party, which right now seems pretty split, especially from the conversation we've just had. Doug, we'll start with you. Yeah, so I think we need to lead all of uh, Colorado, and, and we have better ideas than the Democrats. I heard the Democratic debate the other night, and uh, they have a vision for Colorado that is, that is more taxes, it's more government control, it is uh, just a very different state than the one I want to live in. And I think Republicans, all of us, believe that it is we can do more with the, the uh, infrastructure that we have. We have to fix our roads, improve our schools, make health care more affordable. We have better ideas about this. But I just want to, uh, if it's okay to circle back because yes, I am uh, frankly tired of this attack on my family. I mean, we don't choose our family that we grow up in. I grew up in this family. It isn't some dynasty. I went to work as a, uh, as a teenager, uh, pay, paid for groceries often, and uh, it was interesting to me that, that uh, Representative Mitchell, when you led the Never Trump effort in uh, the summer of 2016, you reached out to me personally to ask if I would make an introduction to Mitt Romney. And uh, I uh, declined to do that. I was supporting Trump. So I am tired of this. All right. Let's go down the line. Again, we're talking about the division, which we're it's seeing. It's completely not in, true, but in, that's in, okay. In, in grand, big, okay. bold type letters right here. The division within the Republican Party. Victor, your answer. I don't see the division. I mean, you have to look at our support base. I mean, we have establishment people, people, most of the people I served with in the legislature 10 years ago, I served just one term, and most of them, so I'd consider many of them, would probably your definition of establishment, we have moderates. Uh, I just talked to two people today that said they're changing their party affiliation so they can vote for me. We have hundreds of people we ha uh, that have done that. We have a third of our 50,000 Facebook supporters are registered unaffiliated. They're supporting me. So we have an incredibly broad base. Yes, I mean, it's, the media likes to play up this broad division. Uh, but but division, I've been a unifier. You, we my, just showcased right here on the stage. I mean, we just talked about 
I'm better. I'm a better candidate than the other guy because I'm less establishment than the other guy, and it's gone back and forth. So I guess I I understand both the the answers about unaffiliated, which is going to be another question. So that's great. But what about the Republican Party? And 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 if there is no division, that's fine. But we seem to showcase it. So if you want to answer that, great. Then we'll get to Greg. It's a contested primary. Of course, we're going to draw differences, contrast between one another. Uh, but that doesn't mean we're one party. What bothers me the most about the Republican Party is that we're perceived not to be inclusive. We are an incredibly inclusive party. Yes, we have some crazy people in our party, as do the Democrats as well. Uh, but by and large, we're an incredible. What do, what do the Republican Party stand for? We stand for less government. We stand for more personal responsibility, more ability to pursue whatever path passion and dreams you have. Um, we're trying to run a very positive, substantive, inspirational campaign. I think we've tried to stay true, stay true to that, the okay. whole thing. That's why if you go through everything we've done. But, you know, I know the media likes to hype this up, that we are really this terribly fractured party. I just I, I haven't experienced yeah. that over yeah. the last okay. year. Greg, let's finish this up. Well, I can tell you this. You know, I talk about unity. Mm-hmm. I talk about unity because there is a difference. I know where I go. I can feel it. Okay. I think the party is looking for, in both sides, whether it's Democrat or Republicans, they want to trust their elected officials again. They want to have faith that whoever is applying for the job is really going to try to do the best job that they can, that they're really going to care for the people of Colorado. They really care about the issues, that they really want to make sure that they understand what is going on in all 64 counties. And so for me, you know, it's about unity. It's about uniting ourselves as a country. You know, and as a state, I'm the only candidate predominantly from the Republicans that goes to the Democratic forums when we get invited. And I get asked, why do you come, Greg? You know, you're the only one traditionally that shows up. Why do you come? And I say, because as governor, I'm going to represent not only the people that vote for me, but the people that didn't vote for me. So it's about unity. That's what my campaign is about, because I do sense that division that you're talking about. Let's move on, Sean. Yeah, let's go back to a policy question. Governor Hickenlooper uh, recently vetoed three different marijuana bills. One would have added autism to the list of medical conditions eligible for medical marijuana treatment. Another would have allowed pot tasting rooms at dispensaries. And the third would have allowed publicly traded companies to invest in pot businesses. Do you agree or disagree? with his decisions on these. And I'm trying to think, do we start with you, Doug, on I, this I one? I think maybe we'll it's my it turn. Kind yeah. Of well, no, yeah, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Greg on this one. Let's start with, we had to start okay. with good okay. Greg. All right. Go ahead, Greg. You know, it's going to be shocking, but I agree with him. I think mm-hmm. really what Governor Hickler is realizing is that he should have taken a stance in the very beginning, right? And now he's kind of looking at it from a different perspective. I think he's looking at it correctly. I think we need to be very cautious when we move forward with marijuana because we need to make decisions based on what is gonna happen into the future of Colorado. That's what's happening today. You know, we need to have those visionary glasses that when we talk about legislation, how is this gonna impact Colorado over the next 15 or 20 years? And I think he's realizing that the decision we made early in the back, in the back end, now we're starting to see some of the things that marijuana has brought that I don't think we're really prepared for as a state. I would have disagreed with the governor. I would sign two of, th- of those three bills. I would have signed the autist- autism bill. I mean, mar- I've come a long way on marijuana. I've been reading up and really studying and talking to a lot of people. And medical marijuana is actually quite promising, most especially with opioid addiction as an alternative to get people off of opioid addiction. Uh, we have to start funding federally, looking at this to see what the potential of this plant uh, really is. Um, the second, I would not have, I would have vetoed the bill regarding expanding into marijuana bars. I don't think that serves any good public mm-hmm. uh, service whatsoever. And I believe the, th- the third point. Publicly qu- traded. A public trade, I would have approved that only because, you know, this is now embedded in our Constitution. Um, you know, if a public company, there needs to be access to free capital. And I also think for the first time uh, that we should also possibly look at allowing uh, marijuana dispensaries uh, to bank legally here. But it's also this is going to take a lot of collaboration with the federal government because it's obviously regulated as a class one felony right now. And there's this contradiction. But I think the horse has left the barn. I think medical marijuana is here to stay and possibly recreational marijuana very well might be here to stay. So the question is what to do about it. I can tell you that the marijuana revenues are being completely and totally ripped off. I mean, they were promised a public education. We're seeing record sales every quarter. 
Uh, I've put forward a very specific plan to get a website in place that shows every dollar that's coming into the state with those marijuana revenues and getting them out to our public schools, especially our rural schools, full transparency, accountability, and public scrutiny. But I generally, I disagree with the governor. I would assign two of those three bills. Okay, Doug. And I agree with him on vetoing all three of them. All okay. three of them are bad for Colorado families. I think you know, we had a conversation about this, Sean, when um, marijuana was first legalized. My wife and I were concerned about who was watching out for the kids, and it turns out our state government was not. We were sold at the time that through legalization, three things would happen. We'd get more revenues for our schools, the black market would shrink, and we'd keep it out of the hands of our kids. And and we have not done a good job in all three of those things. And the organization that I founded with Diane has been the leader. We're responsible for over 15 pieces of legislation that have done exactly trying to put some guardrails to protect kids as this has gone forward. And so he did the right thing, but there's so much more that we can do. And we can look at the CBD elements of marijuana, no THC, but high CBD. And we need to be a leader in researching are there opportunities for that and treat that like a medicine and let's tax and move people from the medical side into the commercial side, get the tax revenue we were promised, use that to better our schools, go after the black market more aggressively and do a better job of educating our kids. I will lead on those things as governor of Colorado. Let me answer a question that our sponsors at ARP have supplied for our candidates. One of the, uh, the question they wanted to ask about Colorado's budget is uniquely constricted by sometimes conflicting constitutional amendments that restrict taxes on one hand and raise them on the other. What ideas do you have for balancing these conflicting amendments so there's adequate revenue available in our state to provide essential services to the rapidly growing number of older adults and their families? Victor, it's your turn to start. Well, I've, I very specifically, uh, when I served in the legislature a decade ago, I served on something called the Legislative Audit Committee, and it's a very, it's actually the only, most people don't, I've never heard of this committee, it's kind of an obscure committee. Uh, it has pr uh, the same numbers of House members and Senates, the same numbers of Democrats or Republicans, so it doesn't matter who's really in charge. It does really, really important work. It audits various state bureaucracies. I want to change the mission of that audit from financial-based auditing to performance-based auditing. So these are independent accounting firms like KPMG and Grant Thornton and other companies come in to the state and they look at these bureaucracies. But instead of just looking to make sure our P's and Q's are accounted for, let's make sure that we're right-sizing our departments. I want to drive out a lot of waste and inefficiency. This is what I've done my whole career as an entrepreneur and all the six different companies I've successfully built. I believe if we, if we can save just 3 to 4% uh, by going to performance-based only, that's another billion dollars a year than going to higher teacher pay and other uh, major state priorities in our state. Greg? You know, when you talk about these conflicting, right, you're probably talking about Amendment 23, the Gallagher Amendment, the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. You know, for me, it is a complex issue. You know, I can't sit here today and give you the answer. You know, people have been talking about this for years, but I think we really need to look at different things. And when we're talking about raising revenue, we're talking about providing services. I think it's about prioritizing. You know, these are issues that the people of Colorado said, these are the parameters we want you to operate under. You know, and it, like you said earlier, we're applying for a job. Our boss has told us these are the lanes you need to work within. You know, it's up for us to look at them, really study them and see, can we adjust them? Can we tweak them? But ultimately, we got to make sure that we look at our existing funds and maybe we reallocate some of the funds where, you know, where the lottery money is going, you know, where uh, other uh, the, t the taxes for gaming is going. Maybe we look at the entire budget and reevaluate it before we start talking about, hey, let's look at what we want to remove. When the boss says we can't do this, let's not go there first. Let's look at something else. Doug? So I will defend Tabor. Tabor is not the root of our problem. It actually has kept us from becoming California already. What is wrong about having a cap on spending and asking the voters to approve any increase? The Democrats ask, act as if they have some sort of superpowers and know what's best for all of us. Tabor has been a bulwark for Colorado, so I would defend Tabor. Gallagher may need some changes, and I would be open to looking at whether the uh, uh, reassessment should be pushed out a little bit, whether we should look at different regions in the state rather than as a statewide calculation. But we have, the, the, the main thing is, we now have a $30 billion budget in Colorado. That makes Colorado state government the largest industry in our state. 
larger than agriculture and tourism, which forever have been our two largest industries. And we have to do better. We have to have somebody from outside the system that has run businesses that can come in and drive efficiencies to spend more on those things that really matter, our roads and our schools. Sean? I just want to move to uh, criminal justice. With what seems to be um, continual increases in the Department of Corrections budget, um, which offenders do you think should be in prison and which ones shouldn't? Doug? Yeah, this is another area where we can save, I believe, tens of millions of dollars. I was just out in Lyman uh, uh, two weeks ago, and we had a little meet and greet there, and the head of the correctional facility came down. He was talking to me, and he said, you know what I'm doing right now? He says, I'm processing a clemency request for somebody that beat up a guard in the Lyman Correctional Facility just a few weeks ago. There's no chance ever that this thing is going to be gone through. But back in Denver, they need to process so many clemency re requests each year to show that they are being you know, compassionate to these uh, uh, folks that are in there. That's $500, he's saying, that that's co costing me today in terms of the things that I'm doing. We have to do a better job of managing that like a business so that it's more effective and more efficient and uh, and looking at who's in there and and whether we could have uh, some uh, that shouldn't be I would be open to that as well uh, but uh, I think we have to do a much better job in managing our corrections okay. Victor we shouldn't be criminalizing any recreational marijuana uh, marijuana or other type of drug use we should that's a that should be a monetary penalty a civil penalty but not criminalizing we have a great deal of brown and black people in prison today for frankly petty recreational use we should be looking at that and basically giving, talking about clemency for those types of offenses, not talking about people who are drug pushers, of course, but people who are convicted. And the system generally is not an equal, has not been an entirely equal system for many people. Uh, if you have resources, the system works best, better for you. It generally works better if you're white. We should come to terms and recognize that. So we do need judicial reforms in our state. I mean, we should be processing criminal, true criminal uh, behavior, a criminal that is actually violent, that causes damage to, to property, to individuals, uh, but we should not be criminalizing uh, you know, recreational type uh, drug use. We should be treating them with compassion. There should be a great deal more public awareness mm -hmm. done to discourage kids from using drugs. But I worry about an unequal justice system. We also live in an age, and we don't want to come to talk about this as well, that we, but we come to an age that a great deal of false allegations are put forward. Almost on a day. When I grew up, it was unheard of to hear of a false allegation. This particular generation, there seems to be a good deal of false allegations. People's reputations can be slandered. Um, so we also have to look at basically tightening the process. If you're a victim of a false allegation, uh, the, the government can't keep records on you and things of that nature but uh, so the system the system absolutely we do judicial reform here in Colorado I'm not an expert in this there but that's what I've done I'll put a great team of people together that have really studied this issue as well are you referring to the Me Too movement uh, not, no, I wasn't really pr referring to the Me Too movement but because I don't have any evidence of that, but I just see people, and I've talked to many people, happens today in a lot of custody battles where there's a lot of false allegations uh, leveled against one parent or another to advantage this. Uh, there should be real consequences with the way our system works right now. If you put forward a false allegation in certain categories, you basically have immunity and the accuser doesn't have any right, virtually any rights. So, and, they, and then a record is formed. It doesn't mean that the person gets charged. So you gotta be okay. careful about these types of things. I mean, I worry about the deep state in our, and the deep state is real. We have a, I think we frankly have an overreaching okay. a government that's gotten too powerful. Um, Greg, I want you to address this in terms of who should be in prison, who shouldn't, and you know, we talked about this, and a lot of people with mental illness end right. up in You know, and, and I'm, gonna, too. Good point. Good I'm, gonna, point. I'm gonna stay to the question and not go down the bunny trails <laughs> uh, because there's a lot that you can talk about. But out of respect for the questions and you that are asking it, you know, there is some issues going on with the judicial system. <clears throat> you know, I'd like to see, you know, there's veteran courts here in Colorado. There are veteran courts that we look at a veteran when they do something wrong, we don't send them to prison right away. We provide them with additional services. We provide them with additional counseling. We should look at offering that to others because I do believe that we are too quick to sentence people, right? And we don't give them the opportunity to understand that maybe we made a mistake. Maybe there's something else behind the crime, whether it's a mental illness, whether it's something else, a trauma or something like that. But before we send them to prison, 
we need to make sure that we are allowing them to understand that there are services out here. We want you to be a productive citizen to our state. So I would like to see us do more along the veterans courts for those that are non-veterans, because I think the veterans courts work very well here in the state of Colorado. Thank you. Sean, can I just make a, a brief add on this? And okay. that is that uh, mental health is absolutely a huge issue in Colorado, and we have Thank to you. invest more there. Um, two years ago, uh, I led with, with some other folks a, uh, the ability to put 150 mental health professionals in the schools across Colorado. This is now law. It is making a difference for Coloradans every day. And uh, so we have to put more resources into mental health. I couldn't yeah. agree with more. I mean, it's such a critical issue. And 30, 35,000 people a year just in Colorado have a mental health crisis. This actually touched our family on a very personal level with our eldest child. But, you know, you never know. And she's, by, she's thriving today. But mental health is very, very different than primary care. Every person needs a unique patient treatment plan. Um, there is no question about it. We as Republicans can't stick our head in the mud when it comes to mental health. And I think all three of us sat on a, a mental health forum, and we generally agreed. Uh, there was a gr great deal of agreement, uh, both on the Democrats and the Republicans, when it came to dealing with mental health here in Colorado. Let's Thanks. see if we can get some disagreement on this one. Um, <laughs> uh, the issue of immigration is uh, something that's going to be in, uh, heated in any sort of political conversation, whether it be national or state or even local. But specifically the idea of sanctuary cities. I have heard ads and different points from each of the candidates about this issue. But I guess uh, one, my specific question when it comes to Republican is the whole idea of local control. Because I hear that a lot from different Republican, re Republican lawmakers and candidates. And sanctuary cities, if you're a governor, if you're standing against them, are you going to be one that goes and tells Aurora what to do about this particular issue? Uh, Greg, I'm going to start with you as a former mayor of Parker. If you're the mayor of Parker, how welcome is the opinion of the governor of Colorado about how you and your city run your affairs? You know what? Here's the thing. You know, as a sitting mayor, you also are kind of sitting like a sitting governor. Your job is to make sure that you're protecting the totality of your community, not just se certain segments of the community. You know, I would welcome a conversation with a governor. That doesn't mean that I have to agree with him, right? But at the end of the day, when we talk about sanctuary cities, we're talking about the well-being of a community. You know, I carry the Constitution of the United States in my pocket every single day because, to me, these are the founding documents that give us our rights and protect us. Okay. I'm a firm believer that no one gets extra protection or extra rights. We need to make sure that we live under the rule of law. You know, and so for me, you know what, when a city says we're going to do certain things, well, there is no boundaries by which those residents can go on to another community. And so we need to be aware that we're talking about the totality of the state. And so I do not support sanctuary cities. I think they're un-American. I think they're unlawful. I think they send the wrong message to what America stands for. Victor? You know, as governor, we can't force cities like Denver and Aurora from, and Boulder from not being sanctuary cities. But what we can do directly through the long bill is cut off funding. And I plan to do just that. And this is another... So let me, let me, let me confirm on that. So Absolutely. if you were governor, the idea of sanctuary cities, if Denver and Aurora continue to have sanctuary city policies, you would move to cut funding to the cities of Denver and Aurora. 100%, absolutely. Right. And second of all, to put an end to this, um, I would also work to pass civil, civil liability legislation for any mayor or town council member, commissioner that refuses to cooperate with federal ICE agents when they have a criminal al alien and, and they subsequently release them back into society and put us all at risk. That's what a big difference between myself and there Walker be? Stapleton. That's a fundamental difference. He's on the record that he doesn't support civil liability of mayors and uh, commissioners. I think that we absolutely, and this would be, put an end to this. But I also think we should work with President Trump and pass comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, Colorado would be a big benefactor of comprehensive immigration reform. We're very much an agricultural uh, state. And the deal that was on the table, which I'm not sure if it's no longer on the table, was a very fair deal. I mean, $25 billion for walls, uh, to build a southern wall and other security in exchange for the DACA kids having a pathway. That's a very fair deal. I still don't understand what the obje how objectionable that was and why that couldn't get passed. Doug, as governor, what do you, how do you handle sanctuary cities? What do you tell cities? Uh, what, would your, what would your policy be? Second day as governor, I would have the uh, mayors of Aurora and Denver and Boulder into my office. And I'd say, OK, how long do you need to put policies in place to comply with federal law? You need three months? Do you need a month? 
uh, and, and also use the power of you know, compelling them through the funding that comes from the state to the cities to, uh, to compel them to do this. This is absolutely, this is a matter of safety and compliance with federal law. I live in Arapahoe County, but I have worked in Denver for the last 22 years. The policies of Denver matter to me and to my family. So this is something that we cannot allow to, ha to, to have here in Colorado. So go ahead, Sean. So year after year, I'm gonna go back to another legislative question, um, since one of you could be the next governor. Year after year, the legislature takes up a bill requiring some form of paid family leave. Do you support that concept, Victor? No. Because okay. as much as I think we have given paid family leave, as all the six companies I have, we've always done that. But we don't, I don't think the government should be forcing small businesses uh, to have mandates. We already have, Sean, 120, you, can, you can't make this stuff up. We've had 120,000 pages of regulations. And we're a small state in the last eight years. This administration, we have never been as regulated as we are today. We're regulating dog walkers. There was a woman last week. She got shut down for opening a <laughs> lemonade stand. I mean, this There's is- There's more to that story. I covered that one. <laughs> Greg, do you want to I mean, jump in here? mean, it's ridiculous. No, we don't need no, any more I, I mandates would, on small I business. I would not. Look, being the former director of the United States Small Business Administration, <laughs> you know, I recognize that there there's 500,000 small business out there. They employ over a million people. You know, to require this, you know, it's truly a burden on the success of rural Colorado and other companies. I think small business owners truly have a connection with their employees. You know, you will go, I'm a small business owner. I do go over and above and beyond to try to help my employees so they can have a good quality of life with their families because we recognize that it's them that really help us be successful. It's not the product, it's, not, it's the people. You know, not, so, all, not all businesses do. And each year we have families come down and testify, single moms who say I have to choose between staying home with my sick kid or my job. Um, so, I mean, well, I don't know what you change, say to look, those people. What, what you're trying to do, though, is, is legislate morality. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't legislate morality. You know, you have to be able to change the tapestry of the mindset of people, you know, to make sure that everybody, I, I still live under the golden rule, right? Uh, treat others as you would like to be treated. You know, and those are the type of things where we have to have discussions with corporate America, with CEOs, have discussions and try to figure out how we can do this. But to legislate it, I think that's the wrong path. I think that's not the right way to go. What do you think, Doug? So I uh, had a, a great opportunity a few years ago to serve as a lay pastor in my church. And the, I, I learned through that experience that the single best thing you can do for a kid or for a family is for mom and dad to have regular full-time employment. So we need to be increasing the opportunities for our businesses to thrive and succeed, not putting more mandates on them. And uh, this uh, paid family leave, it's another thing, you know, minimum wage by each city. Every year these come up in the legislature and they're just flat out wrong. They are not good for small employers. And I, I, you know, I, I understand the need of that family and, and uh, so on. I ran a business, it was a small business, it became a larger business. We took those things into account. People came in and said, listen, I've got this circumstance. You say, okay, go do what you need to do. The way is not for some top-down mandate. It's for people to talk and communicate and deal with the problems that they have. Uh, if one of you win the primary, you'll be on the general election ballot in November, and joining you on that ballot will likely be uh, one, if not two, questions about transportation funding in the state of Colorado. Uh, right now, it seems that, we'll just continue the an analogy, probably two very distinct paths when it comes to funding. One saying, fund it with the money we already have and concentrate strictly on transportation. One being, let's actually raise more revenue so we can pay for other things needed. And earlier in this debate, we all had smiling and nodding heads about mental health and all the different things we could do. So there are other things to pay for in the state. Which, way do, which path do you choose as uh, this might be a part of the election ballot this November? Uh, I think we're up. For, Doug, it's your turn I to I think start. it's my turn. <laughs> so this is clear to me. This is one of the fundamental responsibilities of government is to build our infrastructure. And we have just not spent the money on it. Uh, when Governor Owens was the governor, over $200 million a year came from the general fund to C supplement CDOT. It's been about 50 average over the last 12 years. Our roads are a mess. We're stuck in traffic. Drive around the roads of this state as we have, and you see how poor they are in the rural areas of this state. We absolutely have to spend more money, and it's not a tax increase. The uh, sales tax increase is regressive. It hurts those that can least afford to pay for it. Let's do what Bill Owens did. 
let's borrow the money. And I think it's not enough. It's about three and a half billion dollars that we need to really make an immediate impact on our roads. It's widening I-25 in both directions, four Collins, two Colorado Springs, four lanes in both directions, no tolls, no new taxes, and it's a, and a mountain access and, and projects around the state. And I disagree with uh, Representative Mitchell that we don't have the money in CDOT today to fix this problem. We need hundreds of millions, billions of dollars, and we can't find that money. We have to borrow the money in order to make this work. See, and this Victor? is the difference between myself and my opponents. Uh, I don't support any new tax increases. I don't support any new debt increase, uh, increases. Uh, CDOT needs fundamental structural reforms. And, in, and, and we can do this. We can, we can fix CDOT. I don't know what the right amount of money, resources is, because we don't know how much is in waste. But we know that the, it has been probably the most badly managed uh, state bureaucracy in government. And that's the difference. I mean, Doug comes from a back, background as an investment banker. I come back from, an, from a background as a CEO of creating operating companies. And I can tell you right now, you don't throw good money after bad money. Uh, we might look at a bond increase two or three or four years from now after we reformed uh, the department. But to ask people to pay more money into a broken system, most people are still not earning as much money as they were 10 years ago during the Great Recession. And there's a transfer of wealth when we take money out of the private sector and move it into uh, government. We have to be a better steward. We have to learn how to put the government on a diet and do more with less. I believe we can get $2 billion into roads directly without increasing taxes or fees. That would be a big step forward. I think we can deal with a lot. More, there's going to be a lot more traffic science. People, we haven't even talked about autonomous drivers, which are coming to Colorado in the next year or two. That's going to also change the dynamics of the type of infrastructure we're going to need. Right. Victor, you talk about two, <laughs> can I just say, he talks about $2 billion into roads. Our CDOT annual budget is $1.4 billion. $1.6. I I was going to $1.6. I don't know where that money is coming from. Where is $2 billion coming from unless we, we bond it or tax it? It's not, and taxing is not the right approach, but we do need to fix our roads. It is an immediate impact uh, through coming up. So I'd, like, I'd like to answer that. Okay. It has been many we still need Greg in here. Let's, let's, let's get Greg some more in. And I just, Greg, right. I want you to talk about, too, it's been many years since we have put general fund money into transportation. This right. is the first infusion of that in a long time. The gas tax has also been right. going down, that, that money, that funding. So what are your thoughts on, on Victor's plan here? You know, it, being a former mayor, and I was a city manager at the same time, so I had to deal with road construction. I had to deal with growth. I had to deal with all these issues that we're dealing with today. You know, and I, to your, ta to your question about taxes, you know what, I would not support any tax increase because any tax increase is really focused on the urban corridor and it's going to hurt rural Colorado. I believe it's about prioritizing. It's about, I truly believe about, you know what, you set your goals, you establish parameters, and you move forward. You can't keep everybody happy. You know what, one of the things that we do as government, and I think it's a real uh, travesty, is we let people believe that government is going to solve all issues all issues and when we do that we set aside the faith-based organizations we set aside nonprofit organizations do you think faith-based and nonprofit organizations can solve transportation I was say, <laughs> no, when, we're talking, when you, you, when you okay. were talking when you were talking about hey there's a the lot other of services other, the there's other, a lot okay. of other services that we have to okay. do right so we prioritize on our roads like Doug mentioned there's a certain responsibility that government has okay we need to acknowledge that responsibility. We need to be true and strong to that responsibility. And then we need, when others are gonna say, well, what about these other services? You know, human nature allows us to help each other. You know, and that's what we have lost. You know, and we'd lose it because people believe government mm -hmm. should be doing that. And I think we need to change the narrative. I think we do have the money to build our roads. I think we need to think outside the dome. I think we need, you know, one of the things I'd like to do is talk about buying E-470. You know, before Mayor, Hogan died. Him and I were talking about buying me, the state, buying E-470. It's owned by three counties, five jurisdictions. I sat on the board and he asked me, Greg, why would you want to buy E-470? So imagine what would happen if we take the tolls off and people can actually use it to go around the entire corridor. You know, we were talking about that. We we're having a discussion. You know, it, unfortunately, we lost him to our Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. But these are the types of dialogues we need to have in order to solve these issues. Now, we're running close on time. We have about two and a half minutes before closing statements. So, Sean. So, this has got to be a quick, quick answer. answer. Um, is Did you hear that, Victor? <laughs> is education <laughs> underfunded in Colorado? How much money would fully fund it? Where are we starting? Greg, are you up first? Greg's up next. Yeah, you know what? Is it underfunded? 
I think, again, prioritization, right? We have to look at, you know, we've been funding education. If you look back to the last 20 years at every education, right? In the year 2000, when we passed Amendment 23, they said our gap between measuring where we were with the national average was $800, right? Today, we're over 2,000. You know, so we keep adding money to these things, but we're not prioritizing. You can't solve the educational problem by just throwing more money at it. I think what we need to do is, again, step back, take a breath, Let's look at how we're spending this money, okay. you know, because again, these are the types of things that we really need to have strong discussion on. Doug? We need to spend more money in the classroom. And uh, we've seen a bloat in the administrative costs of our school districts over the last decade or more. I would, if I were governor, I would incent our school districts to move money from administration into the classroom, matching with the state funds any dollars that they moved in that direction. We do need to pay our teachers more. We have to have more money to computers and books and those things that really make a difference. It's not a big tax increase. It is prioritizing how we spend the money in our transport so, in our hi, education. Putting some strings on this funding. Yes. What do you think, Victor? We don't know is the answer. I mean, stru the uh, public education needs structural reform, but we know that there's a great deal of money that's being ripped off through marijuana revenues that could go uh, directly into the classroom. Uh, we know that um, that we, our teachers are abysmally paid, but it's also going to require reforming our public pensions. Uh, if we can reform our public pensions, I put forward a very specific plan to deal with that, then we'll be able to get more money into public education. I've been part of the school choice movement pretty much for de more than a decade, um, taught at two major state universities. Uh, education isn't the foundation of life. Education is life itself. So I think we should fully fund the schools. Right now, the a good deal of it is going into administration and the 176 school districts we have across the state. Okay. Gentlemen, it's amazing how fast an hour can go by. <laughs> uh, it is time for our closing statements. We offer a one-minute closing statement to each of our candidates, and we choose the order by drawing numbers out of a hat before we roll tape. So right now, uh, based on that order, Doug, you're up for your one-minute closing statement. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. When I started, when we started our business a few years ago, we sat down and we realized that trust in each other's competence and character was the key to our success. That's going to be the key to our success in November. I have had years and years of proving my competence. Started a business which advised hundreds of companies employ and making a difference in employing thousands of Coloradans across Colorado putting together nonprofits, three of them that are making a difference today for Coloradans, making their lives better, stepping up and leading the way on over 15 pieces of legislation that have positively impacted Coloradans' lives. I also have the character not to have this election going forward about baggage or things in our past. We need somebody of character. I have the competence and character to lead us to victory in November, but also to fix our roads, to invest in our schools, to make government more accountable, to build our future as the best state in the country to live, work, and raise a family. You can learn more about me at DougForColorado.com. I would very much appreciate your vote. Victor, you're up next for your one-minute closing statement. It's hard to believe, but 41 years ago, I was sleeping on a floor and taking care of a single mother. My mom is uh, legally blind and deaf, uh, so I know what it is to overcome great adversity in my life. We were almost homeless several times. And then when I was 21, I started my first business. I've never worked for anyone other than myself. I've been a job creator and innovator. I've helped hundreds of others uh, create their own businesses. Uh, when I started this journey 16 months ago, we had some of the lowest name ID in the state. And now we're basically neck and neck uh, with Walker Stapleton. Uh, why? Because I'm the only true outsider businessman. Why? Because I've tried to stay authentic to who I am as a man. Why? Because I put forward big and bold and different and substantive ideas to reform a whole slew of our state bureaucracies. I'm only the major candidate that's refusing any and all uh, lobbyist money, any special interest money. I'm also not taking any political interest. We're going to put Coloradans first in everything we do. I ask for your vote on June 26, and God bless. Thank you so much. Greg, you're last up. Your one-minute closing statement, please. You know, I truly believe that the job of the governor is to protect, preserve, and promote the various economies and the different ways of life that make Colorado the great state that it is. It's about 64 counties. It's not about the urban corridor. It's about all of us not just some of us. You know, I come from humble beginnings. My mom and dad were migrant workers and they worked in the fields long hours. But they taught us boys two very important values, compassion and integrity. You know, and being the mayor of Parker, Colorado, I learned all the issues that there is to learn about transportation, water, economic development, regional development, growth, setbacks, quality of life, 
quality of life is something that's very unique for us here in Colorado. And as governor, my job is to make sure that we preserve not only our history and our heritage, but rural Colorado as well. Because together, we can make Colorado's future a future that we can all be proud of, a future that we can leave with our children, where our children will look back and say, you know what, our, fa our fathers did a good thing for us. My name is Greg Lopez. If you want to learn more about me, go to lopezforgovernor.com. I ask for your support, and may God bless each and every one of you. Well, that is all the time we have for our debate featuring the Republican candidates running to become the next governor of Colorado. I'd like to thank all of our candidates, Greg Lopez, Victor Mitchell, and Doug Robinson. I'd like to thank my fellow panelists, Sean Boyd, of course. If you'd like to find out more information about this year's primary election races, please visit our websites, cpt12.org, cbsdenver.com, koanewsradio.com, and kunc.org. Remember, primary election day is June 26th, and the mail-in ballots were sent out this week. I dare say that many of you might have them on your kitchen table as we speak, which is why we want to debate this week. If you are an unaffiliated voter, you can participate in either the Democratic or Republican primary, but not both. I know Lynn Bartles would want me to tell you, if you send in both ballots, neither will be counted. <laughs> be sure to tune in next week when we kick off our Both Sides of the Story high school debate series Friday at 9 p.m. It will restore your faith in our future, I promise promise you these amazing high school students to beat the issues important here in Colorado and do a fantastic job. I dare say they do some better than some of our ballot initiatives as we'll see in the fall. For everyone here at Colorado Public Television, I'm Dominic Tizzuti. Thank you very much for watching. Good night.